Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I am doing Comic Uno's Best Comics of the Week, and this is the show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go least favorite to best pick of the week and everything in between, and this week I have a giant haul. I have 17 books mix up for not having an episode last week, uh, and of course in the comments below, let me know what your pick of the week was, because at the end of the episode, we talk about the viewer's pick of the week. So let's dive into this this huge haul. I don't think I've had this many books in a long time. So number 17 for me is Extreme Carnage Alpha issue one. The only reason I tried this was Flash Thompson. I wanted to see what was going on with his character. I like Flash, but I haven't been enjoying the Carnage slash Venom events as much. I feel like they've been overdone uh, since that that huge Venom event a couple years ago, I don't even remember what it was called anymore, but I feel like now every quarter we get a new Venom event. I liked King in Black, I thought that was pretty good just because it did tie into the main series, but when you get something like Extreme Carnage, where is it exactly tying into? And it's going into one shots of some sort, it just feels like it's it's an event for, an, for the sake of event, uh, where King in Black I felt was a bit more driven by the Venom main series and there was a lot of build up towards that event. And that was my biggest issue with with this issue in particular. I just didn't feel like it had much of a drive, didn't have much of a direction or even a main voice here as well, or main character. So it was just hard to get into this one, and and I'm just probably not going to get the next issue again. I think they're just one shots anyway, so it's just kind of weird the way they're telling this story. It's not really tying into stuff, it's just one-off so I guess we'll see where that goes the next issue is scream you got lasher you have riot and all these other symbiotes coming coming about but it just kind of feels like a filler arc to me so that is number 17 moving on to number 16 which is black smith ahoy comics uh issue one I got this on whim I like werewolf stories. It was a detective story. I'm like, this sounds interesting. Uh, but the comic is in black and white. Now, there are certain books I like in black and white. Obviously, you have stuff like The Walking Dead. Uh, there's another book I'll be talking about that was in black and white and has always been in black and white, which is Terry Moore's books. And I think it works really well there. But I don't know if it really heightened the story for Black Smith or blacksmith and uh none of the characters really intrigued me too much I, I do think it's an interesting concept to see a mystery story with werewolf mythology kind of mixed together but i just don't feel like they utilized it to the fullest and again i, I just couldn't really sink my teeth into this one so i don't know if i'll i'll be getting the next issue but glad i gave it a try and and giving that one two stars and that is number 16. and i forget if i told the extreme carnage uh rating if I said two stars, it's, a, it's actually one and a half stars. Uh, so moving into number 15, which is one of the bigger books this, this week because they are not reprinting this and they're not collecting it. And that's Skybound X issue one. So they, you know, Image and Skybound has, has really been hyping this issue up because again, not being reprinted, I'm sure they're trying to get uh, more of the spec market to, to get their eyes on it. Uh, but this issue was a little underwhelming for the sake of how much it was hyped. It, it's, it's a glorified anthology. The first part of that actually being a reprint of a, a Walking Dead issue. Now, I actually haven't read the story because I haven't followed Walking Dead really at all. I think I read the first volume. Uh, so, yeah, I, I never read the story. It was it was fine uh, for someone who doesn't really uh, feel a connection to The Walking Dead. Uh, but then, yeah, the other stories, I don't know if it really helps sell anything. I feel like this is a good opportunity to tell a short story that would help sell those books, especially because I think most of these are actually, you know, still going on. So Clementine is getting a middle grade graphic novel, which I think is a cool concept because, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing more companies dive into all ages books and and not just the DC and Marvels, even though DC has been doing it for a while. And this is a good opportunity for more people to get into comics and, and showcase different stories. So I think that's great. But I don't know if any middle schooler is going to be picking up this comic. So I, I think it's a weird place to promote it. You have Manifest Destiny. That's many issues in. I, I don't follow the story and it was kind of hard to follow the short because of it. And, and same thing for Ultra Mega. It didn't really feel very new reader friendly to me, even though I think that's one of their newer issues. Now, uh, saying this, the the next um, 
the next issue has some franchises that I like a little bit more, like Birthright. I, I enjoy that book, so I might check out the next issue. It really all depends on... Oh, and also they have Stillwater next issue, so I probably will check that out and see if they try to aim it to new readers or, you know, readers like me who have read both books. Like, is it aimed more for the readers who already like that story and, and does that work for an anthology-styled book? So overall, I gave this two and a half stars. It just wasn't worth the hype for me. Moving into another book that was very hyped up this week, and that is number 14. Go we're going into number 14, and that is X-Men, issue one. So X-Men, I guess, is kind of going into a new era, uh, but still very Hickman. This this issue felt very Hickman era, where we, we get to see, I guess, a mixture of what people want with the x-men they're back in new york uh and and they got their their tree house and uh they kind of have this power rangers moment and they go into this like mecha machine and and have a big old fight in central park and then then the end you get a little bit more plot where this guy uh wants to learn how the x-men are resurrecting which I think is interesting, you know, that's definitely a big concept from Hickman's run that that has been one of the stronger concepts. But I just felt like it was very by the numbers, this issue, but at the same time, very bogged down. It just was very wordy and very exposition heavy, uh, but at the same time, really action-y. I just felt like there was no moments that really helped me sink my teeth into this issue and, and feel moved by the issue at all. I just felt like it was very jumpy. It wasn't too character driven in my opinion uh wasn't a bad issue i will be giving the next issue a try i want to give i mean this is the flagship i want to give a couple issues a try for the x-men but uh, i enjoyed hickman's run so far a little bit more even though that felt a little bit um less focused because every issue had to do with a new character but at least it, it kind of was a little bit more character driven but i think because we missed the superhero elements of the x-men so much that's why this issue dived in so heavy into that moment and, and into that idea of the x-men but it didn't feel pure superhero either it did feel very hickman and and very exposition this is stuff that's you know here's a here's everything about the mythology of the x-men and and dumping it into one issue so uh, yeah a bit torn on this one artwork i also didn't think was so strong for a flagship I, it just it felt um forgettable to me so i'm giving that two and a half stars and that is number 14 this uh the next one's a new book and uh, this is number 13 ordinary gods issue one uh, i probably wouldn't have gotten this on a normal basis uh, from just a concept. But the reason I got this issue, cause it's Kyle Higgins and I absolutely adore Radiant Black. It's one of my, one of my favorite comics on stands right now. Uh, I, I just think it's brilliant. And I was like, okay, a new indie from Kyle Higgins. I'm gonna try this out. And this one just wasn't for me. Uh, you know, it dives a lot into this like history of reincarnated characters and gods and, and obviously it's called ordinary gods. And then we go into our main character or main character. And when we first find the main character, I'm like, oh, this is super interesting. He's going to therapy. He's talking about his depression. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm in for this. Like, I, I, I like that this feels very grounded compared to what we just saw with these godlike creatures. And then it just kind of goes off and, and his little sister starts killing people. And I guess it has to do with this, this god mythology thing that they were trying, trying to describe throughout the whole issue that kind of got me lost. Uh, it just felt like there's a lot of information being thrown at you and the shock value uh, didn't hit as hard because it's the first issue and it just it felt like I was a little bit more lost than like oh my god that just happened this is or just kill people I'm just like wait what like okay because like, that was our grounded moment so when the grounded moment became non-grounded there was nothing to really reach for it didn't really feel anchored this issue so I don't know if I'll get the second issue I also didn't really love the art I think the cover is probably the strongest of the art style but other than that there's times where I feel like some of the pages feel a little rushed and and the facial expressions aren't as strong as they could be so overall giving that two and a half stars and that is number 13. All right, moving on to number 12, which is Batman issue 110. And this is, I, I guess, one of the preludes to Fear State. 
think we're getting Fear State next month. So we probably have like one more issue of a prelude and then we go with the Fear State. Which I'm super excited for, for everything they've been teasing with. But the reason this is a little lower is because it's so much a setup. It's so much a setup to Fear State. Nothing really happens. It's very much an action issue where, uh, you know, we, we get to see Batman's in trouble. The Bat family tries to help. Miracle Molly gets into uh, some trouble of her own because she's the perfect scapegoat for everything that's going on with Gotham. And I think my biggest issue here is that it didn't really focus too much on Scarecrow, which is definitely the element I'm more interested with with this arc, and focused more on peacemaker peacekeeper i think it's peacekeeper uh i do not like that arc and i didn't really like future state so it's been really hard to see so many titles rely so much on future state and and this being one of them and and being like oh get excited we're we're doing future state and i'm like but i didn't like future state when it was going on so i just i don't love the build up they're they're heading towards but there are things from fear state like i said like scarecrow is super interesting i really like miracle molly so uh there's definitely elements i liked about this issue and it was very well done action issue especially between peacekeeper and batman but or peacemaker i don't even remember their names but uh yeah i i like the action there the artwork was really good for this issue but it's just a very forgettable issue as they're they're leading into a bigger arc so it feels a bit fillerish to me so i'm giving that three stars and that is number 12. all right moving on to number 11 which is Noctera issue five. Now, uh, you know, I feel like this issue had a lot happen, which is good. We we get to see the brother go through his transformation. It doesn't seem like he's being affected anymore, but we learn a little bit about the brother too. He purposely affected himself, so infected himself. And that was kind of a big shock. And then also the people that are helping him and helping our main character, uh, is teaming up with the bad with the bad guy. It seems like by by the end of this issue. So there's definitely a lot of elements that were revealed. I just think the the way it was revealed felt a little too exposition heavy. Um, the one thing I'm I'm always weary about with Scott Steiner's writing is that the dialogue is always super heavy, which makes the artwork not shine as much. Even though the artwork is so beautiful, it's just so wordy, the book, that it, it doesn't get to the point as quickly as it could. I think it beats around the bush a lot, and it, it's a slower read because of it. It's harder to really get into the story because it's just so many words, and I think that could be cut down a bit. So overall, I gave this three stars. I think there's some interesting things that happen, but I don't think the execution was as strong as it could have been. Uh, but like I said, artwork was really gorgeous for this book, especially uh, some of the emotional moments and even just looking at like um, our M, you know, the brother's character uh, becoming human again. I think some of the artwork was really great there. So moving on to number 11, a book I... I'm sorry, number 10, a book I was really excited for and I'm, I'm excited to talk about. And it's a book from AWA. Sorry, I need to take a sip of water. It is the summer out. It is hot outside. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, number 11 for me is Fight Girls, issue one. And I was super excited for this book. I, I, I love the concept. I, I, I like this kind of Hunger Games aspect. And it just looked really cool. I really like the artwork a lot. Uh, and those were the strong things about this issue. I liked that it was very Hunger Games. I liked the artwork. I think there's a lot of great humor in this issue, especially uh, between script and art because the artist and the writer is the same person. So I, I love when, when things like that happen. But, you know, I do have a but on that one. I, I do feel like the characters are very hollow. Uh, I don't really get a voice from anybody they try to make them kind of in a horror movie aspect like old school horror movie aspect where they have like a special quirk so you remind you, you remember them like one person like hits one of the girls right away and and she like kind of skyrockets to the top but there's there's more background with her so but i don't remember her name i don't really think there's any emotions coming from these characters which i i wish that we we got a little bit more of and hopefully we see in future issues, uh, but I also I don't really love what the story is built on. It's about this queen that leaves because the husband couldn't have children, so they're looking for a new wife slash queen. I'm like, okay, this is not 
so girl power as we expect. I hope there's a twist where it's not just like these girls are fighting for a power, I guess, but also like this man's affection to just have a child for him. I, I hope there's more to that story. Uh, but yeah, I'm definitely going to see this one through, uh, see what issue two gives us. I definitely think this was a really good action issue and it has potential. I, I just think there was some hiccups along the way. So giving that three stars and that is number 11. Moving on to, I'm sorry, that was number 10. Moving on to number nine, which is Serial Issue 5. I don't remember if I got Issue 4 or not. The the one um, bad thing about, because this is such an indie book, uh, I never really know what the release schedule is for it. Sometimes I see, like, it's being released digitally early. Uh, you know, there's other sites saying it's released this week, and then it's released the week after. So it's a little hard to figure out when the book's being released. Uh, but uh, yeah, going into the issue, I like the serial killer the most. I really like her story. And and even though it feels like very one-off, it's just about this like drunk guy who's sad about his married life and, and is having existential crisis and then she kills him uh, while he's drunk. Uh, even though it was a very one-off story that doesn't do much for the plot and it's kind of similar to stuff we've seen, I was most intrigued with that story. I actually wasn't as intrigued with Zoe's story. And, and I felt like that's been the weaker part because there hasn't really been a plot. Uh, yes, there's this serial killer out on the loose, but that's about it. Uh, the story doesn't really move that much. And that's kind of been my biggest complaint about serial. But what I love about Terry Moore's work is that even if the plot doesn't move, there's always some interesting dialogue and interesting character work where you don't even really notice that the plot's not moving. But this issue, because Zoe's character was so slow, um, I, I felt it a little bit more. Artwork, though, is really good. I do love the black and white style for Terry Moore's books, and I, and I think it really fits for the emotions uh, pretty well. So giving that, I think I gave that three stars as well. Uh, no, I gave that three and a half stars, so that is number nine. Moving on to number eight, this one went a little bit lower, but there's a lot of books out this week. Uh, still a good issue, and that is The Nice House on the Lake, issue two. Uh, I, I enjoyed this issue. I do think it was a little slower because it's them dealing with what happened last issue, which is finding out the world's ending and that their friend is a psycho. Uh, so, uh, but it's also what I liked about this issue is the uh, them analyzing, or at least one of the characters analyzing his friendship with the villain. I, I don't even know what to call him. Uh, and, and seeing, you know, how, what led him here. I do think it got a little bit confusing of the large cast in this issue. Because last issue did a really good job at explaining everybody. This one, I felt like everyone was so mishmashed. I'm like, who are you again? You know, it's been a month. Uh, so I think, uh, I hope I get to learn these characters a little bit more. Uh, and, and I think because it's the darker artwork, it's, it's kind of hard to, to figure out who everyone is as well. Uh, but like I said, hopefully as we get uh, every issue showcases another character, we'll learn more about them. But overall, I like this one. Uh, I just It just felt uh, a little bit more... Um, slower I would say I just felt I felt like it was it was a little slower because we had the big moments from the last issue but I definitely think there are some good pieces of the puzzle in this issue so giving that three and a half stars and that is number eight moving on to number seven which is Wonder Girl issue two Another slower second issue. I know second issues are really hard, but it's so interesting because both those series had really good first issues. So I loved uh, the the nice house on the lake and then Wonder Girl, I just loved the character and I think issue one uh, was perfectly paced and perfectly uh, written and drawn. Uh, but this issue I felt slowed things down a bit because they try to fit more in. So we have like Artemis joins the crew. We have uh, Cassie who joins the crew, which is the element I really enjoyed about this issue. I like that this book is not just Yara. And, and I think that's one thing that we see different from Wonder Woman books, Wonder Girl books in this uh, in this instance, compared to something like Batman or Superman. They, they very much are interested in showing the family a bit more often. With Wonder Girl or Wonder Woman, it's usually just about that one character. Sometimes you'll see them appear in one issue, like let's say it's Cassie's book, then Donna might appear for, as a special guest, but it's never really about their relationship together or, you know, the family relationship. But I think that's something that's changed with this uh, series in general. Everyone feels a little bit more connected uh, and we really 
get to see that with this issue, and that's definitely one of the biggest positives. But I thought Yara was kind of pushed to the side here. Her feelings and the events that happened with her and the, the lake situation kind of wrapped up very quickly. So I, I kind of wish we got to see more from her and, and more from her point of view. So, you know, I think it's a double-edged sword to the fact that they added characters like Cassie and Artemis trying to look for her. But it was fun to see her, them look for her as uh, all they have is that she's in Brazil. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious to see how Yara is going to feel as she learns more about her history and, and her connection to that because she believes she's just a normal girl. Our work also uh, was pretty solid. I don't think this was the strongest Joelle Jones uh, interiors here, especially with some facial expressions. I also feel like Cassie was written to be a little younger and, and a little bit more naive than she usually is, so that was a little disappointing. But overall, I like this issue. I thought it was a pretty solid issue and giving that uh, four stars. Uh, so moving on, I'm sorry, that was three and a half stars. Uh, moving on to number six, which is The Amazing Spider-Man issue 70. I'm happy to see this so high on the list, especially with so many books that came out. I enjoyed this issue. I, I felt like it, it was actually really well paced where we get to see, yes, there's still a lot of stories, but they were all interesting and they all moved. So we have the the build up to the, the Sinister War and Lizard on the loose. So not Kurt, but Lizard and, and Kurt is a good guy now. So to see him kind of join the Sinister Six in a different way, we have Mysterio uh, come back. And then also even dealing with the idea that Harry Osborn uh, has a couple of Harry Osborns, it seems like. We have the one in the jail cell with Carly. We have obviously Kindred and the one that's been found dead. So that mystery is actually progressing a little, which was really nice. It's been a while. And then I actually like Mary Jane hunting for Carly you know, having a story outside of Peter uh, and still being involved in the story. So that was really nice. Peter was in this issue. You know, I think it's been a while since Spider-Man's been active in his own book. So it's nice that he, he had some shining moments in this issue as well. And overall, like I said, thought it was a really well-balanced issue. And I'm excited to see where Sinister War goes next and uh, what that entails for, for Spider-Man since we are wrapping up uh, this whole entire run. So I am curious to see where that goes. Artwork was pretty solid as well. Uh, it's still not the strongest art for Spider-Man. I do want a more iconic look for it, but I think it was pretty doable for, for this issue. So giving that four stars, and that is number six. Moving on to number five, uh, a book I really love, and that is Crush and Lobo, issue two. And this is a very solid character issue. It is still Crush dealing with her breakup or her breaking up with her girlfriend. We don't we don't know who actually broke up or if they're even broken up. And her dealing with those emotions and we get to see flashbacks of how they met and Crush is dealing with uh you know, wanting to be a loner even though she's not and 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 figuring out uh how to kind of fix some of her past, and that's her relationship with uh, Lobo, and, and that's kind of what we lead up to, and there's some really good comedic moments here, a lot of good character moments, which I always feel like Mariko does really well. It's always an entertaining issue, even though this whole issue is just her really going to point A to point B. It's her going to Earth to Lobo, uh, but I feel like there's a lot of entertaining, entertaining moments where it doesn't just feel like that. It, it, it moves very well because it is so character-driven, uh, and there's a lot of moments to laugh at or, or feel connected to with Crush, and the art work is so good for this book, uh, playing into those emotions and, and showing the flashbacks and showing uh, the space uh, moments and, and contrasting them really well. Uh, her just eating a burger was interesting, going into a kid slide and still making that seem action-y in some way. Uh, so overall, really solid issue and, and can't wait to see where Crush and Lobo goes. So giving that four stars and then it's number five. Moving on to number four, I think you guys are going to be shocked with this one. But number four is Runaways issue 37. That's the shocked face. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Runaways was a silent issue for the most part, which not knowing if we're going to get more Runaways after issue 100, I was a little disappointed that this was a silent issue, even though... From a writing perspective, I get why it was a silent issue. We had so many big moments last issue with Nico and, Car well, two issues ago as well, with Nico and Carolina and, and Nico telling uh, Carolina what's been exactly going on with her with the magic, but even, I won't say even bigger, but another big part being uh, the two Gerts and, and uh, our Gert 
finding future Gert. And yeah, there's a lot of emotions here. And, and Andres is just such a talented artist that you feel those emotions really well with no words. And I, and I thought that was, that was really good, but it was such a quick read. And I feel like there could have been bigger moments if we did get words. So I, I'm a little conflicted on that. But the reason this is also in my top five is that there's two major, major moments in the end where we get to see uh, Carolina's people come look for her, which is not good because they want to, last time that they, they, uh, I guess what came here, uh, they wanted to kill her. So uh, that, what's going on with Zavin? You know, Zavin is supposed to keep control of all that. So why is this happening? What's Carolina going to do? Uh, very, uh, uh, very much an homage, I feel like, to when Zavin did first come. You know, ship was coming down. Uh, everything was going pretty badly uh, in that moment. And, and, you know, the story really changed with Carolina leaving. So is that something that's going to happen? Uh, and another big moment, we actually get to see the J team again, which I really enjoyed seeing them, and Alex Wilder wanting to take over the J team. I'm like, man, that was a crazy cliffhanger just to see Alex again and and relating that to, to that arc. So even though there's only like two spoken pages here, a lot does happen. And, uh, you know, I do think this could have been a higher issue if this wasn't a almost totally silent issue but it, it still did the job and and so excited for issue 100. so i give that number four and i gave that four stars moving on to number three which is firepower issue 13. Uh, this was one of the strongest issues uh in in a while i i enjoyed this one where it goes back to basics it's everyone trying to get back to normal but the snakes are released, you know, uh, things are, are not normal. They, they've gone through a lot of things. And I love the small moments. I love, you know, the wife doing kung fu in her in her day job. I, I like seeing how the kids react and, and how they've changed as characters already. We get to see the daughter already using fireballs. I love that moment. Uh, and I just felt like every character had a moment to shine and the plot moved really well here. And I, I like that it went back to the suburbs. I feel like that that's where this book is at its strongest. Uh, artwork was so good too. Again, to, to really get into those emotions and and really show that something's creeping up, especially this whole snake story, which we know the daughter has been seeing these snakes. So I'm curious if she's gonna be connected to all this. I feel like she's gonna be a big key here. So giving this one four and a half stars, I really enjoyed this issue. And that is number three. Moving on to number two which is Baby Teeth, issue 19. This is the penultimate issue of Baby Teeth, and this does not disappoint. It's pretty much a, 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 a letter of, of a goodbye, I would say, of Heather uh, to Sadie, her sister. And Heather figuring out that the mom's not a good person once again, and Heather being the one to take charge because she loves her family, her her actual family, and wants to protect her sister and and uh, her nephew. And obviously, the grander plan of like the demon having all these children, I'm sure, is going to be placed into the next issue with Sadie. But seeing Heather sacrifice herself in such an emotional way with some beautiful, beautiful monologue uh, along the way with some twists and turns with the mom as well just made this such a great penultimate issue that makes me so excited to see how this whole entire story is going to end. Uh, really, really enjoyed this one. It was very murky and, and, and gritty, the artwork as well, that, that just totally works here. Uh, the oranges, just knowing you're, you're coming to the end here, coming to the end of the world. So I'm giving that four and a half stars, and that is number two. Moving on to my pick of the week, and that is The Immortal Hulk, issue 48, another book that is coming to an end. And speaking of love letters, man, oh man, this is such a good issue about, I would say mostly about Betty and, 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 uh, and Bruce, but it's also just about the identity of the Hulk family. And I just think there are so many interesting parallels and, and so many interesting themes explored here. Uh, especially like the change, I would say the flip of the dime of being able to change into a Hulk and, and hiding and wearing a mask was a big part of this issue where Betty's able to kind of interchange between uh, Harpy and, and Betty. And then there's a whole conversation in, between Jen and uh, the reporter where Jennifer's not... Hulk, uh, She-Hulk, and and she's like, oh, it's kind of weird to see you like this. It's like, oh, it's because She-Hulk is 
actually me. And I just thought this whole idea of wearing a mask is and 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 what that means individually to every Hulk uh, really meant something and, and was really powerful here. But what I especially enjoyed with this was the relationship between Betty and Bruce, or we should really say Betty and the Hulk, because Betty is, you know, fed up with Hulk. We know this, you know, she was left for dead. And, and for some reason, she keeps crawling back. And she says that. It's just like, I'm always here for you. Every single time you want to hide, I, I go look for you. Uh, and then the Hulk's like, well, I want to change. You know, I don't want to be that person anymore. I don't want to be the person who feels like they, they have to be strong just because, you know, I don't want to hide from you. And then Betty doesn't really accept that. Because what I, what I love about this issue is that and what I love about Betty and Bruce's relationship in general is that they're not, you know, Iris and Barry. They're not Mary Jane and Peter Parker. They're not Lois and Clark. You know, characters that truly love each other. You don't really know if they should be together, you know? You get the idea that they've been through a lot of stuff, but they also hate each other. You know, they, they love each other so much, but they're in, in a, you know, a, a flip of a dime they they really dislike each other because of everything that's happened and you see that in this issue uh where they're they're getting close or they're really talking about their emotions and and he's like yeah you know i let bruce in hell and he's like you let bruce in hell and they start yelling at each other and and it's this idea of like is their relationship redeemable do we want their relationship to be redeemable i find that so interesting about them and and just seeing them literally trapped in a room with each other to have that conversation was so intriguing because it's not about them loving each other even though they do there's just some so many more complicated uh, feelings there and and i love that from this issue and i think there's some really um iconic lines here and dialogue work that really just dig so deep into these characters um and their psyche. I just really love this issue as a Hulk fan and how it doesn't just celebrate Hulk as a symbol. It's so, well, yeah, no, actually, I think it does celebrate Hulk as a symbol, but not Bruce as a symbol. It is Hulk as a symbol. And what that doesn't, what that means, not just for Bruce, but for everyone he's affected and, and the ugliness to that and what it means to be a monster and, and what it means not to be perfect. I mean, that's really the whole idea here too of the allegory of a monster is that they are angry people. They're not perfect people. This relationship's not perfect. Uh, and you can even say that about Jen as well. Uh, really, really well done issue. I give this five stars. I'm, I'm really excited to see where we go with it. And I, I just thought this was a great character driven issue. And this is the stuff I loved about Immortal Hulk in the first half of of, of this series. So I uh, really enjoyed that one. Uh, also, I should mention the artwork as well. It's just so great to see these, these uh, again, turn of the dime moments where you just see the emotions, you know? It's not just talking heads, it's acting here. Uh, and it, the acting is so good in this issue. So yes, five stars for me. That is my pick of the week. Let me know in the comments below what your pick of the week was. Since I didn't have a last, uh, didn't have an episode last week, I don't have a viewer's pick of the week this week, but I will have the viewer's pick of the week next week, so be sure to let me know your pick of the week. Thank you guys. Definitely follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Go check out my comics like Father Like Daughter and They Call Her Dancer, and definitely go, uh, go check out our comic book podcast, Comic Book Weekly, every Tuesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Also be sure to like, subscribe, and comment on this video. It really does help the channel. Thanks guys, bye.